The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, keep your family and the church continually in the true faith, that they who lean on the hope of your heavenly grace may ever be defended by your mighty power. Through, through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Welcome for the podcast for the seventh Sunday after the Epiphany, Luke chapter 6, verses 27 to 38. Uh, this is the second part of the Sermon on the Plain. This is a new podcast. Um, and if we had one other Sunday in Epiphany, which we don't this year, the longest Epiphany season would include the final text in the Sermon on the Plain. So Epiphany would actually do the entire Sermon on the Plain. So we're getting the first two parts. And in many ways, they're the most important ones or the ones that go together. If you remember last week, we talked about how the Beatitudes and the Woes spoke about ontology, about being, who we are. And the blessings are the way of life, the woes are the way of death. And that what you see here is that there are two ways. The didache begins that way. There are two ways, the way of life and the way of death. And that being establishes our identity, who we are, and it's Christological. As we mentioned last week, the Beatitudes and first, are first and foremost speaking about Christ, and then about those, of, those who are in Christ, those who have communion with him, those whose flesh has been joined to his flesh. And last week we had that wonderful thing where Jesus is touching people, the power's going out of him. That power goes out of him, so to speak, when we are baptized and brought into communion with his flesh and that we are now defined by the life of Christ. That is who we are. That is our being. That is our identity. This week, however, we're going to talk about doing and we're going to see a series of, I think it is 16 um, imperatives, a, a set of eight and then two sets of four. And you're going to see that these imperatives that describe doing are really gospel, because they are a continuation of who we are. So let's go to this text and take a look at it. And to begin with, what we want to do is we want to see the, 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 uh, the, the different parts of it. There are three parts here, and, and very, very important. The first one you can see here is, and I'm sorry I didn't divide it, uh, I should have, is the, it's the, these first part from uh, 27 to verse 34. Whoa, let me get the whole text in here. Maybe I did divide it. Hold on. No, I didn't. Okay, it, it goes to 34. Oh boy, we can't quite get it all in. That's okay. Well, anyway, he, here you have, you have um, eight imperatives. And what we're going to see in each one of these is that there is, um, at the end of the, the, the text, and let me just write it out here, 27 to 34, 35 and 36, this is where we have eight, here we have four imperatives, and then 37 to 38, we have another four imperatives. And what we're going to see is at the end of each one of these sections, there's sort of a summary that kind of encapsulates what happens. This one is verse 31, which is do to others as you wish they would do to you. It's this one here, you know, um, verse 31 here. And then there's kind of a, a little bit more of a fleshing out of what that means. Here in 35 to 36, it's verse 36, become merciful as your Father in heaven is merciful. And then here, of course, it's the last verse too, and it's Give, and it will be given to you. Now, this is, the, 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 these are, in, in many ways, could be the cornerstones of your sermon. You could preach on how these summary statements, in a sense, capture the, 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 the um, imperatives here, uh, the eight, the four, and the four. And I, and I think that they're really, really important to understanding how Jesus is trying to, to deal here with speaking to us 
about what he sees as the significant part of, um, of this sort of life of sanctification. So let's mark, and they're underlined here, let's mark the, the imperatives. And, and I, I want you to see that love your enemies comes first. It will be the first imperative in the next section of four imperatives. Um, so love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, um, bless those who curse you, pray, and what do you pray for? You, you pray for those who insult you, give, where is that, verse 29 there, no, excuse me, turn the other cheek, that's one of the famous ones, um, and do not demand, Another imperative there, back from anyone. And then here's the one that is the summary verse. Did I say that right? Yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I guess it's here in verse 30. Do. Um, I, I may have misspoke myself there. Um, no, no. It's, it's right here. Uh, do. This is not it. It's this one here. Do. Likewise do to them, you know. So there's the eight. One, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> oh yeah, do not demand here. Seven, eight. There are the eight imperatives. And I think it's very important to see that these... Uh, these eight imperatives are the foundation for the life of sanctification. This is the sanctified life. This, this is the, the doing, the Christological reality. This is embodying Christ in the world. This is what it means. Another way of thinking of this is, is, is this is diakonia. This is how we do mercy. This is how we show mercy. This is how we embody mercy. This is how we embody in the world the mercy of Christ. <clears throat> now let's just think about these a little bit in a little different way. If you look at these imperatives, you'll see that they're very, very difficult. When I was writing this commentary, I was in a a time where things, things were not going so well at the seminary. And I, I was struggling. And I remember how, you know, I called my wife in and I said, you know, hon, look at these, these things that Jesus is telling us to do. We have to love our, love our enemies. We have to good do, do good to those who hate us. We have to bless those who curse us, you know. That's hard to do. And I found that if you're struggling with your enemies, if you have enemies in your congregation, the best way to love your enemies is to, is to pray for them. First off, first set of prayers. And as you pray for them, they, they really no longer become your enemies. They become people for whom you are, you know, in a sense, bringing in, in the way in which you deal with them the mercy of Jesus. Um, th th these imperatives are very, very difficult. Um, and you can only do them if you're in Christ. That you can only do them if your identity is to be to be blessed as as Christ was was uh, blessed. And and I think that when you look at these, you really do see, in a sense, these are these are the way to live. This this is that way of life. You know, um, th this is this is how you embody Christ in the world. I remember years ago when I was teaching uh, Luke's gospel, and there was, so, and this happened a number of times. There was someone in the crowd, you know, who is sort of constituted by, you know, the, the sort of self help movements in our country. And, you know, they asked me, you know, uh, give, give me, you know, just give me 10 things to do. I mean, I, I know all you're saying is great, but let, let's, let, let's talk about some concrete things here. And, you know, you really wonder what they're, you know, thinking about, you know, I mean, a, a cliche of way of thinking about it is saying, you know, help old ladies across the street. 
But I said, okay, you want 10 things? I mean, I can give you eight, you know? Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who insult you, turn the other cheek, give to everyone that asks of you, do not demand from them back, and then do to others as you wish that they would have do to you. There, there's eight, and then I can give you another eight, you know? But anyway, he, he was, the, the person who asked it, I'll never forget it, he was dumb, I mean, d downcast, because it's hard to love your enemies. It's hard to do good to those who hate you. Um, let, let's look at what we have commonly come to call the golden rule. And it's the summary one here. It's in verses 31 to 34. And you can see how important it is because Luke, you know, records Jesus, you know, doing more here with these, uh, this, this particular imperative. He says here very clearly, um, in, in, and I'm in verse 31 now. Uh, he says, and just as you wish that men do to you, just as you wish in order that men would do to you, do, there's the imperative, do to them likewise. And then he explains sort of what he means by this. And this is where you can see that this is from, from, from here on, 32, 32, 32, 33, and 34 is midrash on, on this. Okay, so here's what he says. He says, and if you love those who love you, and he's coming back to the, to the first imperative, love your enemies. He, he asked this, and, and we know what you know this, what sort of grace is that to you? For even sinners, for even sinners, Love those who love them. And then now he goes to the next one. And if you do good, and you can hear now the second beatitude, the second imperative. You do good to those who do good to you. What sort of grace is that to you? Even sinners do the same thing. Here you can hear that litany again and again and again. And then finally, and if you lend to those from whom you hope to receive, here you go, lend to those you hope to receive. What sort of grace is that to you? And you can see the, the poya. This, this, this is great teaching here. Even sinners, he says, um, lend to sinners in order that they might receive back the equal things. So, you know, um, just as you wish, in order that men do to you, do also likewise. This summarizes, this final beatitude, this eighth beatitude, and I don't know that that eighth means anything. You know how fond I am of eight. But it, 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 what it does is it goes back and it summarizes the first three. Love your enemies. Um, where's the next one? Uh, lend. And then, wait, there's another one. Oh, and do good to those uh, uh, who, who um, reject you. The, the, you can see here that um, these, th these things here are summar going back and summarizing some of the uh, initial uh, imperatives. Okay, let's, let's go to the next set of imperatives here. Whoops. And these would be 35 and 36. So this is a short little group here. Now you can see how important um, the, the initial ones are. Love your enemies. Um, and look at that, nevertheless, he, he kind of, nevertheless, love your man. Do good and lend, okay? Um, so, so these three here are, are an echo of what went before. Now that's important. You can see a nota bene here. Note this well. This is something that is really, really important. And you can see now that the lending, this is obviously an important thing. Because he says, your reward will be great. 
you will be called sons of the highest because he is kind, he is kind to those who are ungrateful, ungrateful and evil. And then this is the, one of the verses I used as a foundation for our deaconess program. Become merciful. Oik tirmenos, a different word for mercy. You know, we usually see it out of the family of Eleon. But become merciful. And notice it's become. Become. This is, you're becoming this because of your ontology. Just as your father is merciful here, is merciful. You know? Um, a, a wonderful statement about how, in a sense, mercy is a, sum, a summation of loving your enemies, doing good, and lending. You know, expecting nothing in return. Um, so, so mercy now is really another way of speaking of the golden rule. You know, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that is to be merciful. Now, th th this, in a sense... Is, it is a, it's a separate one, but it is a, again, almost like a midrash on those first eight. However, when we get to the, um, the final four, we have a totally new group of um, imperatives. And, and th these are really, I think, ones that, that become for us uh, a way of seeing how, how completely radical Jesus' call is to us in, in who we are and what we do. Um, if you, you look at them, you'll see that there are, as I said, four of them. The first one is do not judge. Um, the next one and, and you will not be judged. So there's that, there's that repeat. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and look at the word for forgive. It's not afiemi, it's apolue, you know, to lose someone, and it will be loose to you. And then here, he, it, it's interesting how he comes back, you know, it, in Luke's gospel, the proper use of possessions is a huge theme and, and the, you know, giving. You know, give and it will be given to you. And this is that, that very um, uh, difficult sort of way of thinking of it. Um, uh, the the uh, metron, kalon. You can see here that he, he's, he's using an illustration that they would understand. Uh, give and it will be given to you a good measure, pressed down, shaken, overflowing, given into the fold of your garment. Now that's, a, that's a wonderful statement. Um, and I guess it's like the grain, you put it in and, and you shake it and you, you kind of sift out what is the good thing. And then he, he ends this verse by saying, um, for, what, for with what means you measure. For with what means you measure it will be measured in return to you. Now, I think in this culture, all people could identify with this. So you have judge, condemn, forgive, give. Now, in a way, here you have ontology, forgive, and then give is be being, what you do in, in light of your forgiveness. And I, and I think these are obviously related. Do not judge, do not condemn. And I think what you see here is that for Jesus, you know, judgment is up to God. And God accomplishes that on the cross. That's where the justice of God is. That's where God's justice is meted out. Leave judgment and condemnation to God. What you are given to do is to forgive and to give or to come back here to have mercy. I always say that there are justice people and there are mercy people, people who really 
They need to be right. They need to do things in such a way that they are, you know, correct in things. And then there are people who are mercy people. And I think people who work in the church have to be mercy people. They have to recognize that the atonement has been taken care of by Jesus. You know, judgment is between the Father and the Son on the cross. And let him be the judge. Let him be the one who condemns. You know, because he's judged and in a sense condemned Jesus on the cross. So, so you know, his anger is satiated and the forgiveness of sins is overflowing. But what we do now in light of that is we do mercy. We, we do unto others as we wish them to do unto us. We, we forgive and we give. You know, <clears throat> and you can see here these imperatives are who we are. And, and they're the Christ in us lived out in the world. I talk about, you know, being as established by liturgia, the gifts that we receive in the divine service where we come into communion with Christ. The sanctification, the imperatives, is the liturgy of life, the bearing in our bodies the Christ who is in us. <laughs> 